Welcome. It's the private life of Peg Lynch. I'm James Lilix, and I'm here with Astrid King, and I'm Peg Lynch's daughter. And as you've learned over the last couple of episodes, Astrid is the one who's brought Peg back to life in so many ways. And you've heard the story of how this young woman from Casa, Minnesota, with a remarkable, remarkable upbringing, uh, went on to invent the characters of Ethel and Albert at a radio station, characters that she would inhabit for the rest of her life. She did, and from Minnesota... She then went on to small town radio stations, and we're going to follow her story in these places, experiencing southern hospitality for the first time and jealousy and all sorts of other things. So she's going off to radio during the early formative years of the medium where everybody had a station. Everybody had a station. Everybody did everything. Nothing about it. They owned a station. And she was very well paid. How much did she, uh, she make them? Easily $1.75 a day. Oh, well, with money like that, I'm sure that she was just buying minks and furs and getting ready for assault on the big city. Because keep in mind that while she's down there in these small towns, she doesn't want to stay there. She still has her eye on the Big Apple. And that's what we're about to hear now in the private life of Peg Lynch. I hadn't been working very long uh, at all at the radio station down in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, WCHV, when I went to see Gone with the Wind, the movie, it just just come out as the fall of 1939. It cost me 75 cents to get in. Uh, well, you should have seen the audience reaction when General Sherman made his appearance, booing, hissing, cat calls. I clapped, which caused a number of heads to turn. They really felt they'd won the Civil War, you know? Southerners did. You can get away from it down there, anywhere. Grandma, even the little girl in the comic strip, would say, Why did the North lick us? Well, honey child, they didn't lick us. We just plum wore ourselves out licking them. It was crazy down there. Anyhow, about halfway through the movie, a young fellow sitting next to me. Now, I didn't know him, but Charlottesville was a college town. The place was overflowing with students, boys. Boys, that is. Girls were not wanted at the university. Anyhow, out of a clear blue, this fellow put his arm around me and grabbed my hand. I could hear his friends behind us sniggering. Well, I sat up stiffly at once and tried to give him my dirtiest look. But the amount of dirty looks that one can give in a darkened movie house are practically negligible. So I stood up to go find another seat when he yanked me back down. And boy, did I get mad then. I hauled off, and I let him have a crack across the face that must have echoed out to the ticket booth. Another victory for the North, I said, before sailing off. Oh, dear. I had brought Vanity Fair, my half-hour radio show, my woman's show, down with me to WCHV, and I went on the air with it at 9 in the morning. It was, uh, oh, I had little plays. It was fashion, food, uh, commercials, monologues, and my husband and wife comedy sketch, Ethel and Albert. I get my idea for the sketch the night before, and then get up about 4 a.m. and write it. I'd allow myself two hours, and I usually did it in that. And then I would walk down to the radio station, which was a, a half-hour walk, and, uh, and then on the way I'd think of the, uh, the monologue I was going to do. And then I did all the commercials at the station, too. And then I wrote... Uh, two 10-minute scripts on Tuesday and Thursday and a five-minute one on Wednesday. And then I wrote a half-hour show on Sunday, and I, and I had to play the lead in it. And I was often... At, <laughs> and I would have to switch leads in the middle of it because I hadn't finished the script yet. So while they were talking, I'd tear in and write the last page as to how thinking on my way into the typewriter how it was going to end... <laughs> And I would write the commercials so that they'd lead in or out of that day's monologue. The Monticello Dairy or Charlottesville Cloaks and Shoes, for instance, might inspire the subject matter for the day's monologue. It was tedious as hell. Good training, I suppose. But it was Ethel and Albert that had the fun writing, really. I think it was the only reason I did it, give myself a break, you know? And I think I based it on the Easy Aces that I had liked. It was a husband and wife show. An early radio show that was very popular all over. She was silly. She, well, I don't know, dear. It was slow and sort of a very nasal, so like that. George Russell, the radio announcer I'd followed down from Albert Lee, Minnesota, 1938, he continued playing Albert. We were not romantically involved. 
well, maybe we had been at the start. I'm trying to remember now. I know my mother had a fit that he and I were both renting rooms in the same boarding house. And I know she was mad as hell that I'd loaned him money to buy a new suit. And of course she was right. I never did get it back. But he was good to me. And he was hell-bent on promoting me and my show. And I liked George. I liked George then. The radio station owners were another matter. Mr. and Mrs. Arrington. They were called. They were uneducated. They were dishonest. They were racist. Hated what they called long whisker to music. Classical. And whenever Mr. Arrington got mad at someone, his first thought was to get his gun. He brought it with him to the station. He told Mrs. Arrington if her first husband ever walked in the door again, he was going to shoot him. And she said, well, she'd just bring her gun and shoot him right back. They pretended to be broke, but bought expensive clothes, diamond watches, cars, that sort of thing. They were poor white trash, as we said then. is about the size of it. They'd inherited a little money, and they'd bought a radio station knowing nothing about anything. You know, horrible people, both of them. And complete asses to boot. And they were insanely jealous of me and my show. One minute they'd kick it off the air. The next day reinstate it when listeners called and complained. George was fired and rehired three times. And he and I spent our evenings writing to other radio stations, desperately looking for work. After getting no replies and thinking, well, that's very strange. We discovered the Arringtons were opening our mail and then throwing it out. Hated us, you know, but didn't want to lose us. My salary at WCHV was $1.75 per day to make any kind of money to live on in radio. Then you had to sell your show to sponsors. I got paid by the sponsors. You had to go around town persuading places to sponsor your show. Theaters, hardware stores, jewelers, that sort of thing. And, And one place might sponsor you for Tuesdays and Thursdays, another just for Fridays and so on and so on. So, So with sponsors behind me, I was making just about $55 a month. And I could even send a little money home to mother now and then, along with my dirty laundry. My success with the sponsors, of course, incensed the Arringtons. $55 a month? Why, $20 a month is great sufficiency for any girl. Don't you love it? Well, unfortunately, you were always at the mercy of sponsors changing their minds or going bankrupt, both of which they did frequently. Well, when the Arringtons kicked my show off the air for the fifth time, I got mad. I did. I fought back. And with George's help, I stood up for my rights, stood up to them, citing FCC laws, which I'd never heard of until then. And the Arringtons capitulated, grudgingly. Well, Mrs. Arrington then accused me of stealing a cash box with $15 in it and tried to take my fingerprints, tried to take all our fingerprints with an ink pad. It was also ridiculous. The police were called in. The cash box was discovered, intact, in the alley outside her office window where she'd thrown it. And then a week after that, both Arringtons were hauled off by the police with a warrant charging them with malicious assault and battery on a bright young law student who'd been working nights at the station to pay for his college tuition. It was a huge scandal. Sponsors, of course, dropped like flies. The Arringtons were ruined, basically, and they lost the station. We also found out that they'd been deducting taxes from our wages but never reporting it to the government. So they got in trouble for that, too. Well, after eight months of this sort of stuff working in Charlottesville, I'd made a total of $445, out of which I had managed to save 40. I put my furniture and typewriter into storage, and I left the next day. George went off in his new suit that I paid for to Du Bois, Pennsylvania, where he'd landed us a job at their new radio station, And I, meanwhile, squeezed in a quick detour up to New York City. I had never been, and I wanted to see it. I was desperate to see it. I had a cold, as usual. It was raining. Things were looking even blacker over in Europe. New York was hot as blazes and a labyrinth of smells, but I loved it from the moment I got off the train. I'd been given free tickets through George to the World's Fair, So off I went on the subway, finding my way out to Flushing Meadow, and at the Grand Parallon Hall, where I was splurging on lunch, $1.50, I suddenly saw at the next table my hero, Noel Coward. Well, I nearly cried. 
I really did. I could hear everything he said. He was witty and amusing, just as funny in real life as he is in his plays. And, of course, I fell even more wildly in love with him. I had no idea it was gay, of course. But it was the highlight of my trip, and I thought, oh, New York, you are such a glamorous place. And one day, I am going to live here, and one day, I am going to work here. Well, the radio job I was promised over in Du Bois never materialized. George got it wrong. The station wasn't even built yet. So with no other options and broke, I took the train home to Minnesota, just missing, would you believe it, just missing by one minute, the one that crashed in Utica, leaving 31 people dead. Luck? Who knows? I like to think so. Well, I hadn't seen Mother in almost a year, and of course had to pretend things were rosy. I didn't dare tell her I was applying for this new thing called unemployment insurance. She had been horrified, you know, the disgrace of it all. I hated being back. I just hated it. My girlfriends were all married. They're all talking about babies, you know, as if I didn't feel like a failure enough already. I was just about to try and locate George and see if I could get my money back from the damn suit I bought him when he called me. And he said, get your train ticket, Peggotty. WTBO down in Cumberland wants us and Vanity Fair, and they want us now. Well, Cumberland in 1939, population 45,000, was filthy. You could wipe your finger across a table two hours after it had been scrubbed, and your finger would come up black, gritty, and sooty. It was known quite publicly as the asshole of Maryland. It was the center of the roundhouse of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, and it was dirty. It was a crummy town, it really was. But it did have a radio station, and it was built, WTBO, and a job indeed awaited. Well, I walked in just as a religious program was going out over the air. Tiptoeing through the studio, I stumbled, probably the new shoes I wasn't used to, and uh, talk about distinguishing yourself right away. I grabbed hold of the sound desk to steady myself, an action which caused the needle of the turntable to jump to a refrigerator ad, leaving radio listeners in Cumberland that morning to ponder the message that our dear Lord is filled with ice cubes. Well, (laughs) the radio station owners, the Beckers, Mr. and Mrs., were lovely. They really were. They liked me and my women's show. And unlike the past stations I'd worked in, they ran WTBO like a business and not a toy train. The place was efficient, it was successful, and clean. My mother would have loved it. I was offered $25 a week to increase, as usual, when and if I got sponsors, which I had to woo daily, as usual, Little's Jewelers, the Liberty Trust, the Crystal Laundry, Peskin's Department Store. And I would go to the dress shop or the shoe shop and ask what they wanted to have on the next day. They, they have a special or a sale or a pushing something. And I was told to watch out for the fellow in this clothing store because he was tall, young, good-looking, and a little handy and inclined to make a pass at you. So I thought I'd better be on the lookout for this. And uh, so as I agreed I was, I'm not too impressed with my story. And I went over there, and I was wary right away. And he said, I think I'll, uh, I'll have the coats. I'll put on some coats tomorrow. And um, so we walked over to the coat rack, and he's telling me about this has a such and so and the silver fox and so forth. And then he pulled out the tag and he looked at it and he said to me, and this is 100% virgin wool. And I was looked at him and I thought, <laughs> I said, thank you, gave him a dirty look and walked out. And I got back to the station. I said, do you know what he said to me? He said, those coats were virgin wool. And I said, yeah, so I realized <laughs> somehow I thought that was making a pass at me. Ethel and Albert was, uh, at this stage, it was still a part of Vanity Fair, 
my woman's show. And like back in Charlottesville, I get the idea for the sketch the night before. I get up early and write it. I go in the air at 10. Now, at the time, I had Ethel. Ethel was a sort of, I suppose you'd say, stereotypical dizzy housewife, uh, always doing silly things, such as... uh, well, let's say there was a grand piano sale with 50% off. Ethel would buy a grand piano even though they already had one. You know, dumb stuff like that. Well, one morning after I'd been doing the sketch for about two or three months, I couldn't get an idea. I had racked my brains. I'd hardly slept. But for the life of me, I couldn't think of one single funny thing, one funny situation, nothing. And in desperation, because the clock was ticking, I dashed off a script about something that just happened to me typing out the last words with about 30 seconds to spare, yanked the page out of the typewriter, raced into the studio, and I went straight on the air with it. I can't remember now what the script was about, but it was something typical, like uh, suddenly missing a shoe and just driving yourself crazy looking for it, you know, because you haven't been anywhere. And it turns out you scooped it up off the floor with a pile of bed sheets that morning for the washing machine, you know, something like that, something simple. Well, when I got to the station the next day, I was handed what turned out to be fan mail, my first. There were about four or five letters, exciting. And one of them turned out to be, I'd say without question, the most important fan letter of my entire life. It was from a woman saying, Dear Miss Lynch, I couldn't believe my ears when I heard your show yesterday. I laughed and laughed because I had just done the exact same thing. Well, I just knew I'd been on the wrong track. It changed everything that I did, everything. And and uh, I realized then that I had, didn't have to look for something to write about. There's always something, always. Giving a party, for example, you, who you're going to invite. Somebody doesn't go with somebody else, you know, and what are you going to have to eat? And he doesn't eat anything with onions. And she doesn't want this and she doesn't want that. I suddenly understood that I wasn't very funny when I made up ridiculous situations. I've been trying too hard. You know, it's like overdoing an acting part, that if I stuck to things that really happen to people, to all of us, things that we can all identify with, well, the scripts wrote themselves. Well, almost, you know, I still needed to get the idea, of course. It wasn't all clear sailing. But when I know where I'm going, if I have my ending, I'm fine. And so from that day on, the fan mail poured in. Uh, sometimes simply addressed to Ethel and Albert Cumberland. One woman even saying how she and her husband felt it was just like listening to themselves that Ethel and Albert actually existed. Isn't that nice? I love that. And the show became so popular that WTBO took it off Vanity Fair and gave it its own 15-minute slot. And the private lives of Ethel and Albert, as it was now called, went out live at 6.45 in the evening. It got to be kind of a joke, I was told, that men were complaining because there was a newscast on from New York, and I can't think who was the announcer, the famous announcer, on at uh, quarter to seven, and the men wanted to hear that, and, F, and the women wanted to hear. They, the joke was that you could walk down the street in, in Cumberland and hear Ethel and Albert, because everybody had it on. And the women wanted to hear Ethel now, and the men wanted to get the news. So, but, so then I ended one script, and which he, he, Albert says, what time is it? And she says, well, it's just 7 o'clock. And he says, oh, darn, I missed so-and-so in the news. That's at the end of the show. By the way, the broadcaster Peg mentions Lowell Thomas, famous globetrotter and later Timex spokesman, you know, that takes a ticking and keeps on licking, something like that. George Russell, in his nice new suit, continued playing Albert until he got fired, having fallen foul of almost everybody at the station, including me. He'd been getting very big-headed about everything. And when he left, to my astonishment, he claimed that Ethel and Albert was his to take with him. I said, I've given you the copy, right? I wouldn't give it to anyone. I still haven't. I also said that just because he'd gotten me the job didn't mean I had to bow down to him or to any man. And then a week later, I got a letter from him asking me to come down to Richmond, Virginia, and to bring Ethel and Albert, and that he would pay me a dollar a script. I said no. But I now needed a new Albert. And in Cumberland, I always had to take an announcer 
whoever he was. I just didn't get an actor. Nobody could pay him anything. And and uh, and I played not only played Ethel, but I they had twins, a boy and a girl, and a dog. I was the dog and the twins, and I was the window shade and anything that uh, portable sound effect and the fellow who played Albert would rub the turntable. He would do the ones that where you had a car crash or we didn't have car crashes, squeaky brakes or, you know, I did the door slams. Well, that fellow was Willis Conover. I don't know if the name means anything, but he went on to become a legend among jazz lovers with his Voice of America radio program, which in its heyday was listened to, I think, about 30 million people around the world. In fact, when I was in Leningrad, which is now back to being called St. Petersburg, I was there with my daughter in 1967, and we were approached by a very handsome young Russian English teacher, so he told us. We later found out he had to be been KGB. But the first thing he said when he heard I was in radio was, do you know Willis Conover? Well, I nearly fell over. I said, no, him. I was engaged to him. Willis was 20 when we met. I was 24 and really sort of cradle robbing, I felt. But it was love at first sight, certainly for me. I don't know what he saw. He couldn't see a thing without his glasses. And he once said a perfectly terrible picture of me looked just like me. But we were a couple for a while, I guess about a year. But, uh, you know, let's face it. You can't expect to work 15-hour days with a person, then go to the movies and romantically hold hands all night. I mean, you're too tired, you know, for one thing. I looked over at Willis one day, we're at lunch, and I said, my gosh, I haven't a thing to say to you. Well, the romance staggered on until he started carrying on behind my back with a rather cheap-looking blonde from the Selenese factory up the road, and then he stood me up. It was for an important dinner at a sponsor's house. And I never spoke to him again, although he continued to play Albert opposite me at the microphone for the next five months. Oh, I bet that was fun. As the saying goes, do not get into a land war in Asia or a cold war with Peg Lynch. And then another war was declared, this one slightly bigger. Japan has just announced a state of war with the U.S., I wrote to Mother in 1941 in case she missed this, I guess, in Minnesota. But I followed it with good news. My fingernails are looking lovely, I told her, which I hope cheered her enormously. Well, I contemplated joining the waves, but they required a minimum of 18 teeth, and I was missing two back molars. The wax looked interesting, until I heard they made the girls line up every three months to get tested for loose, syphilis, and gonorrhea, and to make sure they weren't pregnant, and I didn't fancy dropping my duds for young doctors all the time to inspect me. Then I tried knitting a scarf for the war effort, but I gave that up when it reached across the room because I didn't know how to end the damn thing. The most I managed was a patriotic radio speech, which I ended with, certainly we women are not changed, not less in admiration or appreciation or thanks to the men of America who will, for us, once more Wear the uniform of a soldier. Well, I'd thrown all I had into emoting that last bit, and Mr. Becker, the station owner, said, well, I'd soon be kicking my heels out on some outdoor stage, flag in hand, tears in my eyes, asking people to buy war bonds. Well, I said, fat chance of that, since I am unable to even hum the Star Spangled Banner. At my best, it's only a mutter with an early light and a red glare thrown in now and then for good measure. Well, with most of the men at the station called up, we girls, on top of our normal jobs there, we're having to run the turntables, choose the music, even doing the announcing. I was so tired, I was falling asleep in the middle of a sentence. Well, not in the air. Willis, despite his bad eyesight, he was finally drafted anyhow. So again, I had no Albert. And the last male announcer left at the station had to step in. Stu. He did fine. He did. Well, I kept Mother up to date with all the war news down in Cumberland. We're having frequent blackouts now, I told her, and the Selenese factory has been turned into an ammunition plant. Mother wrote back, bawling me out for not getting a birthday card off to Aunt Florence. Trains loaded with tanks and artillery go past my window every four minutes, 
and sometimes they're filled with German and Italian prisoners of war. I mean, so close you can see their faces. Mother reminded me to make sure to wash my collars and cuffs separately. I really don't think she had a clue as to what I did. Well, 15% of my salary was now taken out for defense. And then later, another 10% went for war bonds, and I had to manage on $7 a week. My electric bill rose to 75 cents a month, which I thought was outrageous. Sugar was rationed and coffee, and Mother started sending me butter and bacon and potatoes from Minnesota. I don't know why they could get them there. And at one stage, we were all told to donate our pots and pans and our good kitchenware to the war effort. So we all rallied, and armfuls of them were tossed over the fence into the big lot, where, in fact, they all still sat piled up long after the war ended, infuriating, I might add, the good housewives of Cumberland. And, of course, during the war, sponsors fell off. Well, I mean, if you can't get the goods, you have no customers, so there's no reason to advertise. Stu, my latest Albert, he finally got called up, which left no men at the station after Mr. Becker was killed in a private plane crash, sadly, leaving Mrs. Becker in charge. She really couldn't cope. Of course, I decided I was never going to work for a woman again, and I haven't. But she started hiring just about every man in Cumberland who hadn't been drafted, none of whom knew the first thing about radio work. I got a call about 3 a.m. from a friend who said, I just turned on the radio. You better get down to the station. There's something going on, and it's going out live. Well, I got up, and I got dressed, and I raced down there. I was the only one with a key with Mrs. Becker away. And the something turned out to be a new young announcer having sex with his girlfriend loudly on a wicker couch in the control room. I flipped the switch to off. Well, it was the last straw, really. You know, we are all so disillusioned, so depressed, so unhappy. We weren't the only ones. It was, you know, as if a national melancholia had set in. And then I got a phone call. And it came just as everything seemed to be falling to pieces. Miss Lynch? Yes? Bob Cotton. I'm a radio producer. Cotton Tunic Productions. I hear you have an unusual program on married life. Unusual? I've been told it captures married life to a T. <laughs> well, I've heard glowing reports. Why are you wasting your time in Cumberland? Come to New York and bring all your scripts. Well, it was just what I needed to hear. And so, a week later, found me heading north with my roommate Phyllis in her old rattletrap car, along with my suitcase, a pile of Ethel Nalbert scripts, and all the money I had in the world, $500. Well, I would have gone the next day, but the woman at the bank said I needed to give them a week's notice to take out that much cash. What do you mean, I said. I know what she's talking about. Don't you just go back there and take it out of the box? What box, she said. Well, the one with my name on it. I said, you know, you keep my money. <laughs> Can you believe it? Well, she gave me a funny look and told me that banking doesn't quite work like that. <laughs> and I was going to be let loose in New York City. Oh, boy, I tell you, no wonder my mother worried sick about me. Cripes. <laughs> Well, mothers always do worry, don't they? I'm sure Peg was worried about Astrid as to whether or not Astrid would know what was coming up next. Do uh, you? I do, as it happens, because I put it all together. In this episode, in the next episode, Peg learns to navigate the professional and personal pitfalls of show business in New York City. Ah, dark secrets of Gotham to come. That's coming up next on The Private Life of Peg Lynch. 